Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Hannaford, a weekly politics program of the Western Standard. It is October the 14th, 2024. Happy Thanksgiving. Underfunded, under-equipped, and in the last few years, undermined by ideologies hostile to military virtue, this country's armed forces have, for this liberal government, been an eternal second thought, or third, or fourth. They have also been treated as a social engineering laboratory to the detriment of operational effectiveness. With me today is somebody who has been vocal about these issues and canceled as a result. I'd like to welcome Lieutenant General Michel Mizanov. Uh, he joins me today with his wife, Barbara, also a retired Canadian Armed Forces officer. And we're going to talk about how deep is the rot and how the Canadian Armed Forces can be put back together. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you Thank very you, much. Mr. Great Mr. to be here. You're very welcome. Sir, madam, you've both had stellar careers. Let me just quote from, the, from what they say about you uh, here. Um, you served for 35 years in some of the top NATO appointments available to a Canadian. You're a soldier's soldier, and they used to love you for it. Two years ago, you, they loved you so much that you received the Vimy Award, which is awarded to, and I'm quoting here, a Canadian who has made a significant and outstanding contribution to the defense and security of Canada and the preservation of its values. So, in Hollywood terms, a Lifetime Achievement Award. When you accepted it two years ago, you gave a speech however, that told a few home truths about how government policy was hurting the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and you called out the Department of National Defense. So you got cancelled. They were quite cross. Now you've written a book about that, and we want to talk about that and what else is in the book, which I think is a reflection on the state of Canada. But first, you were there getting this award. What did you say that upset the establishment so much? Well, thank you. I mean, the uh, the first thing I would say is is I talked about the state of our nation, and I had been uh, for many years uh, unhappy with the way our nation was uh, proceeding, and uh, some of the things I said. I mean, they were my my opinion as a Canadian, and uh, and the fact that I was cancelled for it. Uh, I mean, obviously shows that uh, uh, that that. People disagreed with my 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 views. However, I also think that many others uh, agreed. And I talked about the complacency of Canadians, about uh, the lack of leadership, the lack of uh, the lack of um, of courage in our in our leaders, in our current political leaders and and other leaders. I talked about service and the honor of service and uh, the need for leadership. Uh, you know, and I and I went through a whole bunch of different issues. But as I say, I was speaking as a Canadian. I was given this platform by receiving this this award, and I thought this is my chance to actually voice my opinion. and uh, And some people did not like it. Well, now let's talk very specifically about the the condition of the armed services. As a newspaper person, uh, I I I read what everybody else reads, and I sometimes have access to a little more information, but. It seems that we have an establishment of 70,000, but we probably don't have anything, even 50,000 um, men and women available to deploy. Meanwhile, a lot of equipment has been given away to Ukraine. New stuff hasn't been ordered. The airplanes are getting old. The warships are getting old. Uh, the, you know, the tanks are in Ukraine. Can you just characterize for us the effectiveness of the armed forces as they are today compared with what you knew when you were serving? Well, first of all, this is not a problem that just started today or, or uh, since I left or, or whatever. Okay. We've, the, the Canadian Armed Forces have, have always, in my view, been underfunded and, and, uh, and uh, under supported. One of the, and you described them like that at the beginning, the thing you didn't say was underappreciated. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, Canadians love their armed forces when they come out during a crisis, uh, or when the, the, uh, they're out there on the world stage doing something that, that Canadians appreciate. But otherwise, the, the government, and not only this current government, governments before have always had trouble giving them enough uh, funding to be able to be operational. 
on top of what's going on now, and, I, and I've described it before as a perfect storm. So it's a perfect storm. Be, why? Because the world is much more dangerous today than it ever was. You know, not only the technology advances and AI and the quantum computing and all that stuff, but we've actually got state on state conflicts going on right now in parts of the world. Um, and Canada, in my view, is undefended. So it's underfunded, underappreciated, and our country is undefended. It truly is. If there was any kind of in, in the, uh, attack on our country right now, we could not defend ourselves. And it's because of all the things that you uh, talked about, personnel, equipment, training. Uh, and so that's that's kind of where we're at today. And you also talked about the the let's say the social experiments that that uh, are being undertaken through the armed forces and and to, in my view that has a huge impact as well on recruiting on recruiting and and operational capability yes well it's it, obviously you, you have married a, somebody who has also given their career to the service of their country through the armed forces uh many of the things that i think we're talking about are aimed at the advancement of women. So maybe, Barbara, may I ask you, how do you view some of the initiatives that are coming out of the Department of National Defense and also Department of Veteran Affairs when it comes to memory and honor that, that you have observed? Well, um, I think that what the Armed Forces is doing now is they've lost their way. At, you know, their objectives in recruiting this idea that there has to be a certain a percentage, and I think it's 25 that they've been aiming for, to have 25% women in the military. We've never hit that target. I think when I joined in the early 80s, I think it was around 10 or 11, and we managed to get it up to 17. So this arbitrary percentage, what's its purpose? I think your your idea of a social experiment is 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 bang on. I mean, the military needs to have warriors. I mean, isn't that what a military is? And yet we seem to be hell bent on destroying the warrior culture. I, if there's one organization you want to have warriors, would it not be your military? That would be number one. And number two, these these arbitrary quotas that we set up, whether it's women or it's, it's um, you know, LGBTQ minorities or the special interest groups, what we do when we focus on them is we reduce the standard. And I, I know that that's not going to sit well with a lot of people, but we do. We did it even in my day when we started and, and women are going to carry packs. Well, I think the pack was 60 pounds. Most women can't carry 60 pounds. So immediately they reduced it to 40. Okay. So we could carry 40, but then who carried the other 20 pounds? So this idea that men and women are interchangeable is stupid. The whole idea of, of the military in recruiting should be meritocracy. And if you re, if you if you reinforce meritocracy and get rid of these arbitrary quotas, then you're going to have a force. And you're also a fighting force, a capable force. And you're also going to appeal to the people who want to be in the military. Changing things so that a man or a woman can take a man's place, it, it's not helping us. And you can see the recruiting numbers since we started this experiment, I don't know, two years ago or three years ago when we had that culture um, the, uh, chief the chief command and culture, the recruiting numbers are abysmal. And, and so when are we going to say, okay, that's enough. This experiment didn't work. Let's go back to building a military that we can be proud of and that the people who want to serve will be able to serve and not be placed, put at the bottom of the, of the list because they don't fit one of those little quotas that they've established. That doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, refuse uh, to be inclusive. I mean, I think anyone who wants to serve can meet the standards should be able to serve and and you know should be respected and they should respect the others as well however i think what you could call it is inclusive meritocracy where okay the best you know you recruit the best you recruit in those areas that that uh, you know you can get the uh, the people you talked about the 70,000 people okay so the armed forces completely with uh, regular and reserve is 100,000 let's say right now the word is that we're missing something like 16,500 i believe it's more than that but in World War II, when a unit lost 15% of its of its personnel, it was declared non-effective. So you could actually say the armed forces are currently non-effective. And it's then, it's not just the people you're missing. It's the type of people you're missing. You're missing that middle strata there of warrant officers and sergeants, captains and majors, who've all left because they're pissed off, by the way. That's why they're gone, uh, a lot of them. 
they're they're they find a lack of of leadership lack of courage changing the uh, the dress regulations and allowing man buns and 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 uh, fingernail polish and all that stuff that has pissed off more people i think than it actually has attracted so you're losing these middle managers and you're recruiting at the bottom you're recruiting young young men and women who will take 10 years 20 years to get to to that uh, middle management so it, it's it's a real crisis and right now as i said it's a perfect storm with all the dangers we have internationally our inability to, to participate that's the impact today sir i was fortunate in my journalistic career to visit afghanistan twice and uh, visit the canadian army there to be perfectly honest they seemed like a pretty tough lot and uh, now you are describing man people who care about their fingernails and their man buns Afghanistan wasn't that long ago, maybe 12 years. What happened? Well, it's, it's, uh, I think it's radical progressivism. It's, it's the progressive, uh, the okay. progressive agenda that's, that's been, uh, uh, passed into them in the military. And you know what? The military responds to civilian direction. The military is under civilian control in Canada. That's a democracy and there's no, it's a great thing and everything. Um, however, when the military is forced to, you know, to have these quotas or to, to say, okay, we're going to do an experiment, try to get the, you know, the, the whole diversity, equity and inclusion program into the armed forces. And we're going to put aside meritocracy to get more of these people from special interest, uh, groups. Uh, that's, that's what happens. And you know what? The Canadian armed forces, the personnel, those that are serving now and those that have retired. They're the best that Canada can offer. They're the best people ever. They just don't get the means. They don't get the equipment. They don't get the training. They don't get the leadership to make them the best. And I'm sure that those you saw there, yeah, they were pretty tough guys. And they went to war. And we lost young men and women. So our country, um, you know, sent our brave men and women out there. And and uh, a lot of and not only did we lose a bunch, a lot of them came back sick, injured, uh, injured both mentally and physically. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, we need to look after them. And you wanted to talk about uh, veterans. Well, let's get into it because, you know, our veterans are, uh, are being treated very poorly sometimes. In your remarks at the Vimy Award, you spoke of the, the uh, military contract. That is the understanding that should exist between those people who put on uniform and are prepared to serve to the utmost and the people who they serve and protect. Could you just elaborate what that contract looks like to you and how we are failing in that today? I'm, I'm smiling because my wife sometimes tells me I'm pontificating, but really I describe the moral contract as, as the contract between Canadians and their military. Okay, so the Canadians are, Canadians are represented by their government. The military is the men and women who decide that they're going to serve. A contract implies a, a, an arrangement that one side agrees to do something while the other side agrees to do something, that's the contract. So the moral contract is that our military men and women, they accept to go off and do the things that ordinary Canadians are not doing. They accept to go in and fight for our values, fight for our country, uh, help our country, even in Canada and domestically and, and everywhere. They accept to do that at the price, if necessary, of their life. So that's called the unlimited uh, liability contract. So that's there. They accept to do this on our behalf. Now we on the other side, Canadians on the other side, their side of the contract ought to be, should be, we're going to give them everything we can to make them as successful and as protected and as safe as possible. So what does that mean? That means we're going to give them the best leadership, going to give them the best training, the best equipment, uh, the best education that we can. We're going to make them as successful as we can. So just look at how now that contract is broken. Our men and women still agree to go and do this, but they ain't got all the good stuff. They don't have the best training, the best equipment, the best leadership uh, or education to be able to, to do those things. So I'm saying that moral contract is broken between Canadians and their armed forces. Mr. Harper, the former prime minister, put it very well, as I recall, when he talked about giving the armed forces the equipment they need and the respect they deserve. That was his understanding of the the contract it seems to be yours 
Well, as well it is. And uh, the issue becomes then as a politician, are you willing, do you have the courage to actually tell Canadians, well, we are going to spend more on the armed forces. It's going to cost more money to make them as successful as possible. And unfortunately, when you compete against other, some other social programs, well, you can't really have social programs if you've got somebody else's army in your backyard, right? I mean, let's face it. Uh, so the first thing should be to protect, to enable our armed forces to be uh, able to defend us. And so you need to make choices and you need to have the courage to do that. This current government does not have the courage. That's why I said our, our armed forces are underappreciated. Um, and frankly, it's been that way uh, for a long, long time. Is it a lack of courage? Uh, and I'm going to direct this one to, to you, ma'am. Is this a lack of courage on the part of the government? Or is it that they actually not only don't care about this contract, but they actually have a very different intention for the armed forces? That they want to, well, we were talking about the social engineering aspect of it. What's good? Is it, that, is it that they lack courage or they don't want to? I, I tend to think that they don't want to. I, I tend to think that it's not important to this particular government that, um, and, and they use the military um, not as a force that it's meant to be to look at. They just, they, they, they foist on it, their ideals, their radical progressive ideas. And they, I don't know whether they just assume that we have nothing to worry about. The Americans will look after us, which seems to be a big assumption that, that people have. But they have certainly stripped the military of all its pride and its dignity. And 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 and, and they almost seem hell-bent on destroying it in some ways. You asked me about the sexual harassment side of it, Mr. Hanford, and I didn't answer you and I apologize. But this witch hunt that started, and I'm going to call it a witch hunt because that's what it appears to be. And... I have, I have spoken on this before and I've been accused of victim shaming and um, that certainly was not my intent. I don't deny there are victims. There are victims everywhere. And just as I don't deny that there are predators um, and bad guys in uniform, like there are in every other organization. And yes, these people, these predators should, we should seek them out and we should, you know, draw and quarter them as far as I'm concerned and get them out of there. But this this glee upon which they they jump on these accusations and and if you were to had no idea of the military and you were just to watch the legacy media or mainstream media you would the assumption would be that every canadian every male in canada that wears a, a armed forces uniform is a predator is you know a misogynist is just like a horrible person and in my experience that is absolutely not the case like the vast majority of men that i served with were good guys they were decent they believed in what they were doing um their principle and you know people will say well you know didn't something awful happen to you and there were comments that were made and and i will tell you honestly that you know how did they how did you react to that and i a lot of the time before i even decided how i was going to react to that my buddy, my comrade beside me, male comrade, would pipe up and say, yeah, hey, that's not cool. We don't do that. So this idea that that if something bad happens to you in the military as a woman, there's nowhere to turn to, that every single man you work that you're working with is as bad as the predator, I, I just, I, I'm not buying it. I'm sorry, but I'm not buying it. And then part two of that is that when an accusation is made, boy, we go after the the, the, the person and, and his life is over. And even... As when it turns out that he's found not guilty or or there's or the charges are dropped or there's not enough evidence to 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 prosecute it, it doesn't matter. He's already he's done. And you can look in the news for for the list of, of, of our senior leaders who are finished because an accusation was made and not proven. And so I have a hard time with that, too. We need to look after. I mean, our charter of rights, you're supposed to look after the accused. You know, you're innocent until proven guilty. And that just doesn't seem to be the case in the military. And that's very sad. Well, I'm told, ma'am, that uh, there was a very large increase in the number of complaints after a fund was established to pay out victims who proved their case. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I I really don't think I can. That that came out that was came afterward. I all I can tell you is that in my time in the military, there weren't very many of us, and. 
you would think I would have heard more or seen more, observed more. And I did not. I did not, not on that scale that you see here. And and if there was a problem, usually that problem was dealt with. We have, you know, military police and we have, there's a multitude of avenues you can go to for help. So I did not see this large scale. And, and this was when I joined, it was like a long time ago. When I joined, it was still okay to have Miss September up in your calendar, up in your locker. So, so things have progressed now. When I look at, at how far the young men and women are today, I, I find it astonishing to believe that there, there are that many cases of that kind of harassment. I, I just do. I think for the benefit of the viewers opinion. that we should point out that you were in the military police. I and was. You probably would have seen anything like this before anybody else saw it. Is that a fair comment? Got a complaint. Yes, we dealt with the complaint. I would say that. But again, you know, perhaps it's my memory now, but when I go back to your ladies, what, the complaints that we usually had were, I think what most police forces have, they were domestic complaints, you know, the, uh, like a, a, a couple and a, a domestic complaint there. If there was, um, if there was a predator case like that, um, he, it, it was dealt with. And I, I don't, I don't, I didn't, I didn't come across the, um, the, uh, Russell, uh, Wilson, Russell William. Williams case, like something like that, a predator that was sought out, but it wasn't widespread. I, if that's what you're asking, that's my answer. It was not widespread then. And I, I can't, I can't comment more on it. There were less women there. So you would think that perhaps it would be easier for one of us to be targeted, but I, I did not see it and I did not experience it. And I mean, knowing, knowing Barbara, I mean, obviously we've been married for, for over 20 years and, and I, you know, I think, she would have been the first person to, you know, go after these guys. I mean, it would have been, you know, and, and when she says, I, I just, you know, didn't see it. And, uh, you know, and those instances where there was misbehavior, they were dealt with immediately either by her buddies or, or by the, by herself or by the women themselves who also said, Hey, you know, and most, uh, I think most of these predators are, are cowards as well. And if you uh, kind of rebuff them quickly, most of them will back off. But I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible what's happened. And I think the whole question of reparations as well, in terms of, you know, looking after those that are found not guilty, who, uh, you know, uh, we need to do a better job and the armed forces need, need to do a better job. And women have to be strong too. Like, I mean, this, I don't know, it, it's a phenomenon of this day and age that it's, it's almost like, you know, you want to wear a victim's cloak, like you want to be a victim. And I, and that, that bothers me to no end. I mean, you know, women of my generation, we, made our way and we did some fighting and well, we got yeah. to where we were and and now to be suddenly i need you know i need trauma leave because someone said well you're looking hot today like come on like we need wow. to we're, we're not doing the women today i don't think we're doing us any favors by by jumping on the victim's bandwagon and not fighting for yourself i think that has to be that and it, it's promoted this to be a victim it's almost like it's it's something that it's coveted if you can prove you were a victim and i don't just mean in the military but it seems to be the way it is and and again i i blame the radical progressives for this that they have you know it's it's not a inner strength and what is and and um it's the, being responsible taking some responsibility for yourself and your actions and, and and pride and all of those things i think we veered off that path and we need to get back on it and it's today's narrative right now and it's, yeah. you can't go against it if you speak against it you're going to be canceled and that's just the way it is well in the time remaining to us i would like to have you speak about two things first off is what you say in the book it's just been published. Uh, look, can we, can we just, can you hold that oh, up? Yeah. Can you just see the book? Um, this was only released uh, on Wednesday. There we are in defense of Canada. And I think there's a subtitle. What, what does yes, it? Reflections of a Patriot. Reflections of a Patriot in defense of Canada. So you have, you aren't just talking about the military in the book. So I'd like to know what else you have to, what other point you're making there. And then the second thing, would be that we can sit here and damn the darkness, but in about a year's time, many people think, I, in fact, I would say many people fervently and desperately hope that we will have a change of government, and then it will be their problem, but this stuff has already been embedded, and I'm going to ask you how you unembed that and restore some sense of military virtue and the, and the military content, 
contract. But first, what's in the book? Well, uh, in the book, I, I talk about all those things that I talked in my Vimy speech. As a Canadian, I, I go out there and I talk about, uh, you know, the complacency of Canadians who uh, kind of very merrily go along with anything that uh, that the government does, as opposed to having, you know, some common sense, an opinion on things, uh, and even voting. I mean, our voting uh, per percentages are, are ridiculous. And so I think people need to be, get out of this complacency. Canadians need to have an opinion. Uh, I talk about our past, how our past is uh, a glorious past that we should be celebrating and not canceling, toppling statues, etc. I'm talking about Canada's position on the world stage. And that I have, um, I use it throughout the book, uh, kind of uh, personal experiences to illustrate what I'm trying to say. And, you know, Canada had a, a very strong voice on the uh, on the international stage, which it doesn't have today, in, in my view. And then I talk about the radical agendas of, uh, of, the, of the current government, but also current society generally, DEI, uh, uh, democracy, meritocracy. I wanted to talk about, uh, pardon? Yeah, I want immigration. I talk about immigration. I talk also about about the climate and uh, what what this whole obsession with climate um, uh, is about, and uh, and the the impact it's having on our resources. I talk about our economy. I mean, I am absolutely not an expert in any of these subjects, but I have an opinion, and I'm giving it. That's essentially what the book uh, the book is. And then finally, I talk about the military and our veterans. I mean, uh, those are two areas where obviously I can I can speak on. Well, um, let's, let's go the final the chapter. How do we, you know, the Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. How do you put him back together? Well, yeah. So, so then I have the final chapter is how do we fix this? Not only the military, but the, but our country generally. And so, but specifically on the military, uh, I'm going to say first of all, a, a change of government uh, obviously I think will help. There's no, uh, it it cannot hurt. Uh, certainly, what's happening right now. So, mm -hmm. a change of government will 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 help. Uh, the issue getting is getting rid of the DEI. Getting rid of the DEI, yeah, but that, also is the, the sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that, like like many businesses, many companies right now have said, okay, we tried the DEI, it didn't work, or we're going to take what's good from it and get rid of it. The experiment's over, and now we need to. So I think the military, number one, they have to do that, and then recruit to our target market. Recruit to the warriors. Recruit to the 71% of our military are young white men with conservative values that understand hard work and they believe in, in they're proud of their flag, they're proud of their country, they believe in all those sort of old world um, virtues, I guess you could yeah. call them. Values. Yeah. Values. Those are the people. Everything that the liberal government doesn't believe in. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They, you know, post-national, like how, how, why would you put a, go fight for a post-national state? It doesn't make sense. So we need to go back to what we, what we, our strengths are and recruit to them. And I mean, this it, companies have come out and said, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And so I think if we do that, then the recruiting then will definitely go up. And uh, that's, and that's the first thing we need to bring in people that are that believe in, in what the military stands for, that are proud of their country. And once we start doing that, I think everything will start to work itself out. That's my Yeah, that's certainly on the that. personnel yeah. side. The issue also is going to have to be this new government is going to have to talk about the honor of service. I mean, I, and I talk about leadership and service as the way to fix everything. And it's true. It is that. Um, if you look at uh, when the government announced its defense policy update, never once did the prime minister in his speech talk about the importance of serving your country, service to the country. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it obviously shows that he doesn't really care about it. He doesn't really think it's important, but that's how it starts. And then you fix immigration, you fix uh, uh, recruiting. recruiting and you fix retention. Uh, but then you, you can also fix it through uh, through equipment. You bring better equipment in, the young men and women will join too. That's an exciting thing. You uh, you make sure that you can do the training and you have enough money to do the training. Then you take the budget and you make sure you 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 put you make it non discretionary, meaning that you can't raid the budget every year uh, because you're trying to you know uh, cut the deficit. So you know, there's a lot of specific issues you can do to fix this. And my last point would be Nigel. A government will have difficulty fixing everything in one mandate. So a new government, uh, we're going to have to give them the time, the uh, the support necessary to fix this. And you know there's going to be a huge backlash by the others who are going to be uh, left behind and, and are going to say, oh, look, we knew this. He wasn't going to be able to fix that. Well, we're going to need to support him. 
the new government will have to uh, ensure that uh, that it uh, it does the right things, makes the courageous decisions. And when I talked about courage, there's some courage required here to say, here's what we're doing. It's good for our entire country, not just for you uh, in your area or these kinds of voters or this special interest. This is good for the country. And so explain it to Canadians. Uh, it takes a lot of courage. And, uh, and I think we need that. We need leadership. We need service. I think that last point about there's far more work to do than can be accomplished in one term is very much one that conservatives who have high expectations of a new government will have to keep in mind. But yeah. this is the first one that they should be, yeah. well, maybe the second after the carbon tax. Anyway, we're getting off the topic. <laughs> um, look, uh, on behalf of Western Standard viewers, uh, Madam, Sir, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country. Uh, wish you both a happy Thanksgiving, of course. And uh, for the Western Standard, I'm Nigel Hannaford. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.